Hi. In this video, we will have a look at some practical aspects of using labels to form trajectories and some challenges that we face. Let's begin with reminding ourselves of how the trajectories are formed. We have the tracking recursion, where the predicted label density is updated to the posterior label density, which is then predicted, and so on. And at each time step, we extract labeled estimates from the posterior density. And we then take the trajectories from the previous time step and append the labeled estimates from the current time step. And this gives us the trajectories at the current time step. Some pros of using this idea to form trajectories is that it is both simple and intuitive. The unique labels are a nice way to try to capture the object identity, which is unique. Object identity can, for example, be the registration number for a vehicle or a social security number for a person. And using labels also requires very little modification of an existing tracking algorithm that does not have labels. It can be achieved fairly straightforwardly. However, there are also some negative aspects to using labels. One is that typically the labels are implicit, the true object identity which we can call the explicit label, is generally not measured by the sensor. It's unobservable. If there are consecutive misdetections, this can lead to so-called gaps in the trajectories formed by the labeled estimates. We might get physically unrealistic switching when the multi-Bernoulli birth is independent and identically distributed, and in challenging scenarios when objects get in close proximity and then separate. And lastly, it becomes difficult to fuse the labeled estimates from different sensors. And we're going to explain all these four challenges in this video. Let's consider again the example with an autonomous vehicle in an urban area. We have pedestrians and vehicles in the field of view. In this example, the explicit labels, in other words, the unique identity of the object, could for example be the person's name or the vehicle's registration number, as illustrated here. Now the challenge is that these explicit labels are most often unobservable by the sensors, which means that they cannot be known. It can be argued that a vehicle's registration number could be observed by a camera. However, that's an exception to the general rule. If we consider the pedestrians instead, neither their names nor their social security numbers would show up in data from a camera, a lidar, or a radar. So instead of the explicit labels, we use implicit labels, which are static and unique labels that are assigned when the object is born. And here we have labels L, L prime, and L double prime. The pedestrian to the left of the autonomous vehicle is occluded by the corner of the building, and therefore a label has not been assigned since the object has not been detected. And the problem now is that the labels no longer have a physical meaning. We can use them to form trajectories, but we could equally well have used some other labels. So we can say that the assignment of unique implicit labels is arbitrary. There's an infinite number of different unique label assignments that could form the same trajectories. The next challenge we face when we use labels is gaps that might appear in the trajectory. We will illustrate this using a 2D example with two objects and 20 time steps. So on the right, you can see the ground truth trajectories. And we have also written the times that the objects appear and disappear. The first object appears at time three, moves to the right and disappears at time 14. The second object appears at time eight, moves to the left and disappears at time 18. And if we illustrate the measurements, we have that in this scenario, the object on the left is misdetected three time steps in a row, at times 11, 12, and 13. An object birth is here modeled as happening close to the origin. Here we show on the left the most probable posterior global hypothesis and the measurements as red squares. And on the right, we will illustrate the sequence of labeled estimates, which is what we use to form trajectories. If we go forward to time step three, we get a detection close to the birth, which is centered at the origin. And this gives us a labeled Bernoulli. Here we have illustrated the Gaussian mean and covariance. The label is illustrated using a unique color and the probability of existence is written in percent. If we continue to time step eight, the second object appears and we get a new labeled Bernoulli. Here the label is illustrated as orange 
And on the right, you can see how we have a sequence of blue labeled estimates and a single orange estimate for the current time step. If we move forward to time step 11, we have a first misdetection. The probability of existence is lower for the orange object, but it is still large enough so that we extract an estimate for the orange Bernoulli. At time step 12, there is another misdetection, and now the probability of existence is too low, and we do not extract an orange estimate. At time 13, there is a third misdetection. Now the probability of existence is just over 1% for the orange Bernoulli, which is too small to extract an estimate, but is still larger than the pruning threshold used in this example. Then at time 14, the object is detected again. The probability of existence is 100% again, and again, we extract an orange estimate. And if we continue to the end of this scenario, we see that eventually the blue Bernoulli is pruned and due to there not being any detections, again, we stop extracting estimates from the orange Bernoulli. We can plot the extracted 2D Cartesian positions over time, as shown here. And note that we show the X position and the Y position separately. If we use the labels to connect the estimates into trajectories, then we see that for the orange object, we have problems with two gaps in the trajectory which is caused by the fact that at those time steps, we did not extract any orange estimates. We have missed object errors at times 12 and 13. Additionally, for both trajectories, we have so-called false object extractions at times 14 and 18. These are caused by the fact that in the first time step, after the true object disappears, there is no measurement, but the probability of existence is still large enough so that we extract an estimate. So in total, we have four errors due to missed or false objects. Now, this gap in the orange trajectory is a problem, and it would be nice if we could fix it in a simple way. One simple fix that we could try is to work with so-called confirmed objects, which is a terminology that is sometimes used in tracking literature. A confirmed object is one whose probability of existence has been larger than the extraction threshold for some number of consecutive time steps, for example, three or four consecutive time steps. In the estimation, we then extract estimates for all Bernoullis that are either confirmed or has a probability of existence above the extraction threshold. If we look at the orange trajectory, we could confirm this object after a few time steps, extract estimates even though the probability of existence is low, and then we would fill in the gap in the trajectory. However, if we do so, we can indeed fill the gaps in the trajectory. However, due to the fact that we changed the method for extracting estimates, we now have additional false object extractions at times 15, 16, 19, and 20. So in total, we now have six false object errors. Previously, we only had four missed and false object errors. So even though we have managed to fill in the gap in the orange trajectory, it is actually not clear that we have a better result overall. And this shows that gaps in the labeled trajectory do not have a simple solution. Let's consider the next challenge, which is called switching. In this figure, we have illustrated measurements from a 1D scenario and 20 time steps. If we trace these measurements across time, it looks like two objects appear at time zero around positions 10 and 20, and then move such that they are both around position 15 from time five to time 15, and then they separate again. And additionally, it looks like a third object appears around time five at position 30, and then disappears at time 13. And because the first two objects appear to be still next to each other from time 5 to 15, it's not possible to tell with high certainty which object goes up and which goes down when they start to separate again. Arguably, the two trajectory hypotheses shown here have more or less equal probability for these measurements. Either the blue or the orange object went up and the other down but it is not possible to say with certainty which one moved up and which one moved down. So when we use labels to form trajectories and are dealing with this type of ambiguous scenario, we face a challenge that is called switching. Here we have a similar ambiguous scenario with three targets. The three true trajectories are shown in gray. The objects all start on the left and then move to the right. The scenario has 100 time steps, and around time step 50, the three objects are in almost the same position, such that when they start to separate again, 
it's not possible to tell which object goes where. And here we have the measurements that will be used by the tracker. And we see that the measurement noise is large with respect to how close the objects are. So let's study the tracking results for this scenario. Here we can see the results at time step 10. On the left, we have the sequence of extracted labeled estimates. And on the right, we show the global hypothesis from which the estimates at time 10 were extracted. And we can clearly see that at this point, forming trajectories is not a problem. If we skip forward to time step 30, the situation is the same. The objects are now closer, but forming trajectories is not a problem using the labeled estimates. Skipping forward to time step 50, the objects are even closer, but we still don't have any problems with the trajectories. However, as the objects start to separate, the posterior density will contain many different hypotheses. In some, the blue object goes up, in others, the blue object goes down, and so on. If we skip forward to time 74, we can still form nice trajectories. And we can see that the labeled extractions suggest that the red object went up, the blue object stayed in the middle, and the orange went down. This can also be seen in the global hypothesis on the right. We have the red on top, blue in the middle, orange at the bottom. Going to the next time step, 75, is where we get problems. Note how the blue and the orange object have switched. The posterior density contains many different hypotheses. And it is not in all of them that we have red on top, blue in the middle, and orange at the bottom. At time 75, the global hypothesis that we extract from, which is the global hypothesis with highest probability, instead it has the orange object in the middle and blue on the bottom. However, Note also that the state densities for the objects are still very much reasonable, and the extracted positions look good. It's only the labeling that seems to have switched incorrectly. At time 76, we are again back with red on top, blue in the middle, and orange at the bottom. So this means that the estimates switch again. And here we have the three hypotheses from which estimates were extracted at times 74, 75, and 76. The problem with this physically unrealistic switching is that the estimates at time 76 are extracted from a global hypothesis that is not a direct so-called descendant of the hypothesis at time 75, which in turn was not a descendant of the hypothesis at time 74. And by direct descendant, we mean a global hypothesis at time k that results from predicting an hypothesis at time k minus 1 and then updating it with some data association. If we plot the final trajectories for this data, we get the results shown here. We see that there is some switching back and forth for the blue and the orange object. Note also that for the motion model and measurement model used here, this type of rapid movement is very, very improbable and we should not see it in the final trajectories. We should also note that this type of switching does not always happen in scenarios like this. However, it happens often enough for this to be an important problem. Lastly, we have the problem with fusion of labeled Bernoulli densities. In the example shown here, we have two autonomous vehicles with partially overlapping surveillance areas. Note that some of the objects in the area are seen by both vehicles, and other objects are seen by only one of the autonomous vehicles. So in this type of scenario, it's highly beneficial for the autonomous vehicles to communicate and collaborate, as that would improve the tracking, and it could also improve the general performance of the autonomous vehicle. For example, they could share information about occluded objects or objects that are outside the field of view. They could share information about detected objects, which could improve both the tracking and the localization of the autonomous vehicles. So here we have illustrated estimates for the objects in the area, rectangles for the vehicles and ellipses for the pedestrians. And the colors correspond to the tracker that output the estimate. If the autonomous vehicles should collaborate, it's necessary to fuse the labeled Bernoulli densities. However, we can only fuse two labeled Bernoulli densities if the labels are identical. In fact, if the labels are different for two labeled Bernoulli densities, both the kullback leibler and the Cauchy-Schwarz divergences are infinite, indicating a very high dissimilarity. And note that different labels from different trackers has high probability. Most probably, the object did not enter the field of view and was detected by both trackers 
at the same time, meaning that the birth label would not be the same. A simple fix for this problem is to just ignore the labels while fusing. However, if we do so, we effectively ignore the very thing that we introduced to form trajectories. So as we have seen, using labels is simple, but can be surprisingly problematic. And to find an alternative to labels, we can go back to what we are interested in, namely the trajectories. A trajectory begins at some time step beta and ends at some time step epsilon, or if epsilon is equal to the current time k, the trajectory is ongoing. And given these two times, we have a state sequence from beta to epsilon. Therefore, we can define a trajectory state as the tuple beta, epsilon, and x from beta to epsilon. And then, instead of estimating sets of object states at each time step and stitching them together using labels, we estimate the set of trajectories directly. If we use this approach instead, we do not have any problems with implicit labels, gaps, switching, or fusion of trajectories. Okay, that was a few challenges that we face when we use labels to form trajectories. Later, we will learn more about the alternative solution which involves sets of trajectories.